Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. <laughs> All right, we're getting into the last letter that Paul wrote um, during the life ministry of Paul, life of teachings of Paul. And uh, it's readily accepted that this is his last letter. Um, almost a last will and testament is the letter to his protege, his son in the Lord, uh, the closest uh, to him in that manner, uh, Timothy. And so let's get in here and jump in here. Uh, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, according to the promise of life which is in Christ Jesus. And of course, reiterating that life comes from Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Uh, to Timothy, my dearly beloved son. Uh, so here, here he is using terminology, expressing his uh, love for Timothy. Uh, grace, mercy, and peace. Only here and in 1 Timothy is this phrase used, grace, peace, and mercy. Otherwise, Paul's letters use grace and peace. Grace being a typical um, he, uh, Greek greeting and peace being a typical Hebrew greeting combined in his greetings in his letters. Uh, some from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve for my forefathers with pure conscience that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day. Now, really, the, the way the Greek structure is and the way they translate it, it kind of sounds like he just constantly prayed, you know, every day and every night. And really, it's more along the lines of when I think about it or I think of you, I, I, I thank God for you. Was it a constant every day and every night? I'm, you know, it was... When I'm remembered, what I'm reminded, or when I think of you, I, I pray for you and thank God for you. Hallelujah. Um, night and day, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears. And they think that may have been when uh, Timothy last saw him. Uh, he, he, he cried and because uh, he may not see Paul again. And um, that I may be filled with joy. So he says he's greatly desiring to see him. He wanted to see him again. Uh, Paul knows he's about to die. Uh, he's aware of it. He's, he knows it. It says, and when I call to remembrance, the unfeigned. Unfeigned means um, sincere. In other words, feigned is fake or false, un, so unfalse. So kind of a backwards way of saying sincere. So sincere faith um, that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and in thy mother Eunice, and I persuade thee in, in, that in thee also. So we have here, um, and we do know from other writings of Paul that uh, Timothy's father was Greek. And we have no, no statement of his, um, what's the word I'm looking for, of his service to the Lord. We do, have, however, have the Jewish side of Timothy, his mother and grandmother, who have unfeigned faith. It was in them first. So he was brought up in the way of the Lord. He was brought up in the things of God by his mother and grandmother. And that faith is in him. Wherefore, I put thee in remembrance... Again, using that word, you know, he said he was reminded earlier, and he's using that word again, remembrance. Um, that thou stir up the gift of God, the charisma, the, the gifting of God that is um, in thee by the putting on of my hands. In other words, now in another letter, he writes, talks to Timothy about the, the putting on the hands of the presbytery. So there were, uh, at the time of ordination, at the time of the separation of Timothy to ministry, hands were laid on him and giftings and, and, and equippings for his ministry were imparted into him by the Holy Ghost through the laying on of their hands. And so Paul says here um, that I, am, I, I would put you in remembrance. I'm going to remind you. Now do what? Stir it up. Don't forget about it. Don't try to go, get, don't, don't try to go to some seminar and get something else. Stir up which is already in you. Stir up that which has already been imparted into you for the equipping, for the calling of God to the ministry you're called to. Um, and then he says this. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, <clears throat> but that of power and of love and of a sound mind. Praise God. Paul um, says he's not given us the spirit of fear. And not, not Timothy, not, tim tib not being timid and not cowardice. So he's not afraid. Uh, the general idea here is he's not giving us a, a spirit where we, have lack, where we lack confidence, okay? Um, and he, he said, but he's given us the spirit of power, hallelujah, and that word power here is dunami, it's a form of dunamis, dunamis, and um, he said he gave, us, he gave us a spirit of power, 
okay? Or far, you know, he has a, a boldness and a strength to do what he's called to do. Love, which is agape here, or a form of agape, agapes, um, that reaches out towards others and carrying an effective ministry. And then, the certain, and then sound mind. Now, sound mind comes from a Greek word that means more along the lines of self-discipline and self-control. In other words, God's not given us a spirit of fear but, or timidity or cowardness, but he's given us a spirit of power, you know, boldness to minister, agape to love people and to minister to them, and sound mind or self-discipline, control, you know. And so you're going to have to have those things in order to be effective in ministry. And they were given, so this is divinely given self-control. God, you know, instills in, 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 in Obviously, there's a lot of ministers who don't read 2 Timothy 1.7 because they go out and they have no self-control. They live any way they want to live. They, they cater to the flesh. But Paul said, God hasn't given you the spirit of fear. He's given you the spirit of, of, of dunamis, of agapes, and then of a self-control or a self-governed uh, ability to be effective in ministry. You know, he wrote in one place, he said, if we cannot control it, basically if we can't control our flesh, and I'm kind of paraphrasing a little bit, then we're not going to be able to help the things of God. Can't, if we can't do what we're supposed to do individually, how are we going to minister those things corporately? Okay. And then he says this, Be thou not ashamed of, of the testimony of the Lord, nor of me his prisoner. Now, uh, Paul writes later, um, and, and, and writes in other books, that people left him, people deserted him, people abandoned him in ministry. And uh, they, because, you know, a lot of times they just got ashamed of, you know, uh, don't want to, you know, I, I've seen people do it in, in our ministry over the years, you know. Uh, they, they don't want to invite people because we're crazy. You know, we're, we're Holy Ghost crazy people. You know, we might speak in tongues, might run around the church, might have some kind of uh, ex, ex, extemporaneous demonstration of our excitement about the Lord, and they're, they're almost embarrassed to bring them. Well, then, then they get ashamed of the, they get almost ashamed of the ministry. Then they get ashamed of coming here, and they leave. You know, Paul's telling Timothy, don't be ashamed of me. Don't be ashamed of me of me as prisoner. You know, don't be ashamed to be associated with me. Um, uh, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. In other words, you know, don't be ashamed of me. And as a matter of fact, you do likewise. You be bold. You be strong. And, if it, you know, and, uh, you know, you partake of the same afflictions of persecution, of, of resistance, of those coming against you for the work of the ministry. Hallelujah. Now, according to the power of God. Now, who, that's God, has saved us. God saved us. Everybody say, thank God he saved me. Everybody say, thank God he saved me. All right. He saved us and called us for the holy calling. So God did not save you to live in your flesh. He called you to a holiness. He called you to come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. He called you to live a holy lifestyle. Jesus is coming back with the, the, of his vesture. It says holiness to the Lord. It is about living a lifestyle that honors and represents God. Amen. And so our, our, our salvation brings us to a lifestyle where we're to live holy. Now that does not, listen. God makes provision for people when they fail. But you do not take advantage of the provision and fail on purpose. You can't say, I can do whatever I want and it doesn't matter. It does. God called you to a holy calling. God called you to be separate. God called you to live above the fray. God did not call you to stay where you are. Okay? So he saved us, called us with a holy calling, not according to our works. Now, again, this is not, well, if I, if I fast three times a day or if I, you know, if, if I um, uh, do... Uh, some meal offering or wave offering or for I, you know, I, you know, whatever, uh, my ability produces this. No, it's a work. Listen, the, the grace of God does work in us and it empowers us to do. You still got to do. Okay. It's not your works. It's not you coming up with human effort to try to, and try to make it happen so that you're holy. It is the inner working that's there that you cooperate with and allow to work in you and you walk it out. In other words, you don't lay down and go out and sin and say, I'm under grace. No, you thank God that you're under grace and you go out and you don't sin. Because the grace of God strengthens you to empower you not to do those things. It, it, came, it comes to produce holiness in you. And we know God wants you to live holy because the word of God says in the New Testament, be holy even as I am holy, saith the Lord. All right. Okay. Thank you for your enthusiasm. Can anybody be more enthusiastic than you are right now? 
Let me know you're out there. All right. Wave your hand so I can see that you're out there. All right. All right. Okay. <clears throat> so God has saved us, called us for the holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Now, his pur- he's purposed things for you. He's purposed you to walk things out. He's purposed you to live a certain way. And, and listen, he's never purposed you to be a sinner. The, the, the grace of God, the salvation of God, the calling to holiness, the grace of God working you is, is to pull you to his purpose of living in a way that honors and pleases him. Okay. Some people get so crazy, God made you a prostitute just so he could show you, he could save you. Or, you know, so he could help, you know. Uh, I heard one preacher one time say, you know, God makes some folks rich and some folks poor so he can work out compassion in the rich people. Oh, Lord. There's a lot of rich people who are, who are living nice and fine, and the poor people suffering because they're not getting compassion worked out in them. But it's now manifest, what? The purpose and the grace of God that was given to us before the world began is now manifest by the appearing of, the, of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. So the gospel is the unveiling or the revealing to unregenerated fallen man of God's original intent and purpose for their life and the grace that comes with it to empower you to do it. Now notice I say it empowers you to do it. It doesn't make you do it. It empowers you to do it. In the same way that you may have an automobile out there with an engine in it, and if you don't have the battery in it, it won't run. But you go put the battery in it, it empowers it to run. Okay? You crank the engine with the empowerment of the battery, the charge that comes from the battery, and the engine will run. It has been empowered, but you still have to crank it and operate it. The grace of God has come to empower you to live out the purpose that God ordained you walk in before the foundation of the world. And now that Jesus has come, it is revealed to you. The light has come through his salvation. And he's, you know, he's, he's appeared and he has abolished death. Glory to God. Thank God he's abolished death. Are you glad he's abolished death? I am. Hallelujah. It renders, it basically make us, renders inoperative death. Or we've we got to understand, when we start talking about death, we're talking about the kingdom of darkness. And so Jesus rendered inoperative in the life of the believer the power of death to rule and to reign, and he has graced you or empowered you to live out the purpose God's called you to. you still got to work with it now, folks. Hello? you still got to You still have to cooperate. With God. Hallelujah. And he has brought what? Life and immortality to light through the gospel. So the gospel now reveals God's eternal purpose for us. Thank God. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. Wherefore, I'm appointed a a preacher. And this is an interesting um, word. It comes from Kirux. And it means to herald uh, as one with authority to make a public proclamation. So preachers are not, not just somebody who gets up and says stuff. They are, a, they, they are appointed. They have the authority to make public proclamations and herald the truth. In other words, they're, you know, I remember one time I was in, I was in, um, I was in Chester, England. Uh, not Manchester, but Chester. And not too far from Manchester, but Chester. And it's an old, old city. And they had a town crier. We're walking down the streets. All of a sudden, this guy comes out in an old bid. A medieval century uh, garb, you know, and he comes back and goes, 12 o'clock, and all is well. I'm just walking down the street. <laughs> <coughs> the town crier, now if obviously something's going on, there's a meeting tonight at the you know, town hall. <laughs> and that's what he did. He was heralding something. He had the authority to make that proclamation. And see, ministers or preachers are anointed or called or appointed by God to herald by authority and to make a proclamation of the gospel. Praise the Lord. God's called us there. Praise God forevermore. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Hallelujah. And then he says he's an apostle, uh, apostolos, one who is sent, an envoy, an ambassador, He's not speaking on behalf of himself. He's speaking on behalf of another. Hallelujah. 
And he is, he's been sent, what? So he's been appointed a preacher, a heralder, uh, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. Praise God. Now remember, Paul was sent to the Gentiles. Peter was sent to the Jews. And if, you, if you're thinking of what I'm thinking when you think about that, I mean, you would think, God, did you mess up? Or did, the, did somebody lay hands on the wrong person when the, when the word of the Lord came and they prophesied over the wrong one? Because you sent the guy who cuts people's ears off, who is the least qualified to minister to Jews in Judaism, Peter. And then the most qualified to minister to the Jews and minister in, in a way that they could understand because he was a doctor of the law and a Pharisee. And, uh, you know, he said that Peter Gamaliel uh, got sent to the Gentiles, which none of the traditions of the Jews mean anything. But God knows what he's doing. Amen? God knows who he, he needs where. Praise God. And so he says, I'm appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher to the Gentiles. For which cause I suffer these things. In other words, Paul's in jail. Remember, this is a second imprisonment. Paul has been all over. He's been beat. He's been shipwrecked. He's been let down over walls. He's been persecuted. He's been stoned and left for dead. I mean, he was, he's running the resistance everywhere he goes. Preaching the truth. Amen? And he says... That's, and for which cause, what? Being a preacher, an apostle, and teacher to the Gentiles, he suffers these things. Imprisonment, all the things he's gone through. Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed. I am not ashamed. Hallelujah. For I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I committed unto him against that day. So Paul says, I'm not ashamed of where I am. I'm not ashamed of what I've gone through. As a matter of fact, you know, it may not look good. And, you, know, it's, you know, people may, you know, look, uh, so-and-so's got a bigger ministry. So-and-so's got a bigger church. So-and-so's doing more of this. They got more outreaches. They got bigger buildings. They got more money in the bank, da-da-da-da-da-da. And Paul says, I'm not ashamed of where I've been. I'm not ashamed of what I've gone through. You know, I've, I've been persecuted. I've been lied on. I've been spit on. I've had all kinds of things happen to me. Hallelujah. You know, I've had them follow my ministry and turn back on me. That's when Paul had that happen. You know, and I, I noticed today, I, I found a couple places, Paul even laid, told them who they were. In this book, he tells, talks about two people, and then over in a, in a different book, he talks about two more people, you know, and just flat out labels who they, calls their name out there and tells everybody in the world who they are. For the rest of history, we know who these four people are that, that were backbiters or withdrawers from Paul who, who worked against him and caused him trouble. It's in Scripture. That's <laughs> Hallelujah. Okay. But notice he says, I have committed unto him against that day. Paul, um, it means he, he's, he equals his deposit. He's made a, a deposit before the Lord. That day is a day of judgment. And he knows that God's going to honor the things he did and things he kept and the things he did. Hallelujah. Paul is, knows that the Lord is going to honor that. Hallelujah. Can you say Amen. <clears throat> and he goes on and says this. In talking to Timothy, now he refers, back, goes back to Timothy and says, hold fast the form of sound words. Now this here, um, very interesting, when he gets here and talks about sound words, he says, hold fast or keep. He, he, he's told the whole form of sound words, um, example. In other words, Paul's saying here, hold fast the example of sound words. Okay? Um, means healthy, uh, a health giving. Words meaning doctrine. So health-giving doctrine. So Paul says this to Timothy. Hold fast or keep the example of health-giving doctrine. Now, not just physical health, but sound Christian walk. Sound believers. Sound spiritually. Sound mentally. Sound physically. Health-giving doctrine. In other words, that which produces sound, solid, stable believers. Somebody say amen. We don't need unsound believers. Can you say, say amen again? We don't need believers who are, who are unstable. We don't need believers who just run off after, you know, the Bible talks about children who are tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. Amen? You know, we're not to be no, we're to be no more children tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. And there's too many, listen, I, I'm pastor's, those who, who have churches, that you've got people in your church who will go any after the latest, greatest, flakiest thing that showed up on the planet because there's a book out about it or they're on television. And it is not your job to mimic that teaching and encourage them to keep doing that. It is your job as a minister, it's my job as a minister, to give them uh, healthy, I mean, um, 
health-giving, sound doctrine, and I'm going to keep that before them so they grow up, so that they're not flaky. They don't run off after some crazy tangent. Thank, good, thank God for good teaching out there. Thank God for people who are preaching good things. But there are going to be people who come out and teach stuff that's crazy. <coughs> About 20 years ago, there was a big teaching on, war, uh, on, on um, doing warring, the army of God. People were renting the tallest floor, the tallest building in the city to go out there and do intercession against the spirits, of the ruling spirits over the city. And they had to either get in the tallest building or get a helicopter. That was what they were teaching because they had to get up in the heavenlies where the demons were so they could fight them. Poor Jesus. Poor Jesus. He just had to stay down on the ground and fight the devils. Think of how much more effective his ministry would have been could he have gotten up there in a helicopter over Jerusalem and dealt with those devils. He may, he may have avoided the cross. Now I'm being sarcastic here. But pe people were showing up in church in army fatigues. They're the army of the Lord. We, were at, we were, went to Bible seminar one of those years, and Dad Hagen got it and started teaching along the lines of how, how erroneous this was, and a whole bunch of them got it and marched out. Because they, 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 they you get crazy. You get crazy with stuff. And, and here, Paul tells Timothy, keep the form. Keep the, 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 the example of sound words. Hallelujah of uh, health-giving words or doctrine. So keep or, or hold fast or keep the example. What example? Paul's example to him. Where Paul lived in front of Timothy, and Timothy was his protege. And Timothy traveled with Paul and saw Paul operate and saw how he ministered. You know, he didn't get flaky running over here and there. And he wasn't going off squirrely over here. And he wasn't trying to give this group what they wanted to hear to keep them coming to the church. He was, he was determined to give them sound or life or health-giving doctrine. Why? That's what stabilizes you. That's what matures you. That's what brings you up in the Lord. Praise God. Hallelujah. So Paul says to Timothy, now remember, 2 Timothy, Paul's last letter, he's writing things that are on his heart to impart to his protege who will then carry on and keep, and keep ministering things he shared. Okay? And it's kind of like calling them to your bedside and saying, now son, here's what I want you to do. Okay? I want you to do this and I want you to do that. I'm not going to be with you much longer. And so I want you to, I'm passing on the things that are on my heart. Notice Paul didn't say, you know, he, the things he didn't say are, are, are as telling as what he did say. The things he didn't say uh, show us what wasn't important to him at this point. So what did he say? Keep. Hold fast. Keep the form or the example. This is 1 Timothy 1, uh, oh, what are we, 8, 9, 10, somewhere down there. Um, 12. Sorry, 12. 13. We're in 13. Timothy, keep. Keep the example I've put before you of the life or health-giving doctrine. Okay? Hallelujah. Which thou hast heard of me in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. So that we got down to verse, uh, um, finishing up verse 13. He was a temper his teaching in faith and love. Amen? Fidelity and hope. I, faith here is more fidelity and hope than it is of believing you receive from God. This, isn't, this is, you know, having a, a, a uh, you're keeping the faith. You're living the life of a Christian. Love, again, is agape in the Greek. God like, the, the desires the best for others. I'll be honest with you. It would be, it's easier to preach what people want to hear than give them what they need to live right. I remember a number of years ago, um, I, I, I remember parents when I was a teenager and stuff, there were certain parents who wouldn't be cool with the kids. And so they let them do the things their parents wouldn't let them, them do when they were at their house. Why? Because they want to be cool. And it makes mom and dad out the bad guy because they're not cool like someone says dad. Well, the real, reality is someone says dad's a jerk because they're letting them drink or do whatever else they could about their house because, you know, I'd rather my kids drink at home with me than be out drinking somewhere else. So I'll, you know, bring, bring all the people and let them all drink over there while they spend the night. 
and their mom and dad don't, and they're cool with the kids. Of course they're cool with the kids. Mom and dad are saying don't drink, so it's, 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 it's bad. It's going to cause you harm. It's going to cause you trouble later in life. But mom and dad are the bad guy. No, Paul was the good guy. He's passing that on to Timothy, okay? You, have, you love people. You, you teach the right things because you love them, but do it in, in a spirit of love. Okay, now Paul goes on and says this. That good thing which was committed unto thee, uh, keep, now what, what they talk back, back about the laying on the hands of the presbytery. Timothy was imparted to, uh, gifts were imparted to him, callings were imparted to him, the equipping the pastor was imparted unto him to be a minister. And so Paul says, you know, that good thing which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in thee. You can't keep it in your own ability. It was given by the Holy Ghost, you're going to have to maintain it by the Holy Ghost. Okay? When God imparts things into your life, it takes the working of the Spirit in you to keep it in operation. And you're going to have to, learn, you're going to, have to consistently and constantly lean to him. You're not, going to get, you're not going to get good enough. And you're not going to get to the point in life where you can do this without him. You're not going to get there. Now, Samson did that and found out what happened. Cut my hair and, you know, and... And Delilah did. The Philistines be upon me. And here's the very interesting thing. Says The Bible says that when Samson rose, he wist not. That's King James 4. He didn't know that the spirit had, of the Lord had departed from him. So when he rose up to, to break the bands and to break the bonds, just like any other time, he did the exact same thing, and they would snap. It wasn't because he was, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger on steroids. Okay, well, I mean, I know Hollywood, you know, uh, Victor, Victor Mature or whatever his name was that played Samson in the movie. Uh, you know, they had him at that time for him, at that age, that he was really, you know, muscular. I know we got people do stuff now that's like, <laughs> makes him look like a weenie. But back then, for Hollywood, he was really muscular and he would rise up because of his strength. You know, he could have been a skinny little rat. Because it wasn't him breaking the ropes. It was the power of God that came on him. It was the anointing of the Nazarene that was on him. And God had anointed him, and she would say, the Philistines be upon them. He'd get up and just pop, 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 pop. And he got so accustomed to that, and then he told her a secret. She cut his hair while he was asleep, and when he stood up, he did not even know the Spirit of God was gone. And when he went to the break, nothing happened. That's a, that's, that's a quick and very difficult way to have a checkup from the neck up. Okay? To find out you don't have it anymore. And you, you're the same size you were before then. And so Paul's writing to Timothy. He's saying that which was committed to you, that which you received, the gifting that you got from God, you got to keep it by God. You can't go out here and think, oh, because God gave this to me, I can go do this. Yeah. Praise God. Now, see, so there's people who, who, who say stupid stuff like, well, you know, if you've got an anointing to heal people, go empty out the hospitals. Well, I've, I've sat under a number of people uh, who had healing ministries. Dad Hagen, uh, Oral Roberts, different ones like that. And I heard them talk about uh, T.L. Osborne, um, people who had tremendous healing ministries, and listened to them talk. And only when the manifestation of the Spirit was in operation in their life did that anointing work. You just couldn't walk up there and just do anything you wanted to any time you wanted to. Brother Roberts used to talk about how his hand would just burn with the anointing. I've been in service, he said, you know, start talking about it. He said, it's doing it right now. You know? And that man had a big hand, too. <laughs> Brother Roberts. And he would minister to people under that. And it, he knew where it came from. Dad Hagen talked about the Lord, a vision when the Lord appeared to him, placed the right finger of his hand into the palm of his right hand, and said, I've, I've called thee and given unto thee a special anointing to heal the sick. He says, now, when, you, when, you, when, um, when this anointing is a manifestation, you know, the sick will be healed and so forth. It goes on and tells all that. He says, now, you tell them I told you. You tell them I appeared to you. You tell them that I put my finger in my palm of your right hand and told you. Uh, he, said, he said, and when you tell them that, that anointing will come. You'll be able to minister to the sick. He, said, he looked at him and said, the Lord has a sense of humor. He said, I said it's in your hand, not in your feet. You know, but you know, Dad Hagel started telling that story. He said, now the Lord appeared to me and told me. He said, now, he said, there it is. He said, the anointing's right there. He started ministering to the sick. These men, you go back, go back and listen to the healing evangelists. Now, the ones that got off are the ones that they ended up going shipwrecked. Ones that started thinking they had something 
and they had some power. They they could they got off. They, they, you could lose you can lose what God gave you. Paul told Timothy. He told him here in this verse. He said that good thing which was committed to thee by the Holy Ghost uh, uh, unto thee keep. Which means what? You can lose it. How are you going to keep it? By the Holy Ghost that dwelleth in thee. And or in us. He's saying, you know, the same thing in me. The my giftings are in there. And I have to keep them by the Holy Ghost. We can't learn to depend on us to get the job done. We have to constantly depend on the Spirit of God to empower and to enable us to operate and function in the gifting that he gave us. In ministry, in life. I mean, you might, you may, maybe you're not a, a pulpit ministry. But maybe you, ha- you, know, you, you, cannot, you cannot have a pulpit ministry and still have a ministry of gifts of healing. Where you're just ministering to people in, in private. But whatever gift and charisma that God has given to you, you keep it by the Holy Ghost. You keep it staying humble before the presence of God. You never get arrogant. You never take his glory. You never uh, elevate yourself to a higher place than you should be. You know, Paul said this. He said, I'm the least of all apostles. And really, we know he was, uh, uh, historically, he was the greatest of all the apostles. Yet Paul said, I'm the least of all. Amen. He learned this secret. You keep that which is committed to you from God by his spirit, by God. God is how you keep what God gives you. You never start thinking you're something else. You never start taking it upon yourself that I, I can do this without God. We, we stand in ministry by the Spirit. And I tell you something, when you do, you're going to get in error. You're going to start teaching stuff. You're going to start teaching stuff that you shouldn't be teaching. You're going to start teaching stuff that, that ain't even Bible. But you got it figured out. This thou knowest, that all they which are, uh, which are in Asia, now listen, uh, they say uh, the Greek here is Paul exaggerated on purpose to make an exaggerated point. Not everybody left him. Um, Timothy was still following him. He's in Asia. You know this, that they, all they which are in Asia uh, be turned away from me, of whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. 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 Phygelus. And Hermogenes. Now wait a second. Now Paul, just right here, called out and labeled two people openly in a letter that had caused him trouble. Hello? The Lord give mercy unto the house of Onephesus, Onephephorus, for he hath all refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. Now here we got two guys that caused him trouble, caused a, a, a falling away, led a rebellion really. A church split probably. People that following his ministry, he cut them off. He, they, these people got in there and got them cut off. And went down in history as church splitters. Rebels. As uh, Dick said, without a Santa Claus. Anyway, but Onephrasus was refreshing to him. He was not ashamed. He brings us back to this point. Not ashamed of my chain. You cannot allow the pressure of the world's ridicule to keep you out of what God wants you to do and doing the right thing. Boy, I'm telling you, your, your old buddies will come back and they'll make fun of you. You'll, you'll start, when you start compromising here and compromising there, before you know it, you've compromised all the way. Why? Because a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. You put leaven into a, a, to a flour and it'll leaven the whole lump. You won't just have the leaven that you put in there. It'll, 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 it's a borg. Leaven's like the borg. Lower your shields. We will, uh, we will assimilate you into our collective. We will make your biological distinctiveness part of our collective. You know, if you watch Star Trek and the Borg, you know, uh, we're the Borg. We're going we're gonna to assimilate you. Well, leaven assimilates all the other flour. Compromise assimilates your whole, whole faith. It gets into everything. You'll be sitting under teaching. You know's wrong, and you know better, and you'll follow after it. You may, because you allowed that compromise to get in and to take over. And it'll get into areas you would have never compromised in. Hello. Well, 
that one ever be? Can I, can I get a grunt? One holy halfway grunt out there. Now he's talking about a nephew, a nephew for us again. But when he was in Rome, he sought me out diligently and found me. It was, he wasn't ashamed of me. He, went, he didn't care what he knew. He was following me after me. He sought me out. Let the soldiers know I'm following after Paul. I don't care. The Lord grant unto him he, that he may find mercy of the Lord in that day. And how many things he ministered unto me in Ephesus, thou knowest very well. So Paul finishes up this chapter. And then he moves into the next chapter and says, Thou therefore my son. Paul refers to Timothy as his son. This is a very dear relationship between them as a father and the son in the faith. Um, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Thank God for his grace. Can you say thank for God for God's grace? Hallelujah. And it's in Christ Jesus. We come, it comes from Christ Jesus. It is the, um, it is the charis of God. Hallelujah. You know, or kariti, kariti here is, is the Greek word here. Um, but, you know, be strong in the, is, in, in, in the grace is qualified this way. That's in Christ Jesus. It is divine help given freely to those who do not deserve it. Okay? It's only available in and through Christ Jesus. Paul, Timothy, was not capable of doing what he was doing in his own power. There was a divine grace that empowered him to be able to stand in the place he was standing. Okay? Learn to depend on that and don't trust in you. Okay? Hallelujah. And the things thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. So now Paul says to Timothy, just like I taught you, just like I trained you, just like I developed you, now you commit these same things. What? To, what? to who? Faithful men. Not just to anybody. You're to take faithful men and impart these things to him. Why? Because otherwise you're casting pearl before the swine. You just don't give it to anybody who says, well, yeah, yeah, who have no commitment, who have no desire, uh, you know, who just show up because it's the cool thing to do. They go to the Bible school because it's the cool thing to do. They're not there really to learn. Paul's saying, you know, you don't give these things. Let me say something here. God will put you in places to sit under men if you're faithful that others won't get to sit. He's no respecter of persons, but he's a respecter of faithfulness. I know for a fact, personally, I have sat with men of God that we would call generals in, in, in the realm of faith. I have sat at the table with them and broke bread with them and ridden in the car with them and had conversations with them um, that... My faith, I'm not bragging on me, I'm just telling you, my faithfulness in the place that I was at afforded that opportunity that others did not get. Hello? I know this. And so Paul says to Timothy, commit these things to who? Faithful men. It's important to be faithful. You know, the things you've heard of me, among many witnesses, you commit these to faithful men. Why? Who shall be able to teach others also? The reason God was looking for men that were faithful to pass on these things to is so they could teach others also. Now, you think, I, I mean, if I start telling some of the names of people I've sat in the room with, sat at the table with, sat at dinner with, you know, I mean, had hands laid on me by, conversations with. I mean, we're talking Lester Summerall's. We're talking uh, Buddy Harrison's. Talking sitting with, uh, in the room with T.L. Osborne and, and, and um, you know, different people like that. C.M. Ward. Just tremendous ministries over the years. The, and the old Pentecostal circles were, were like giants. These were, I, I remember uh, C.M. Ward. Uh, we were sitting at, we were sitting at uh, dinner with him after, or, it was, it was done after church service. And him sitting there talking about how they used to ordain people in the assemblies of God. He said, yeah. Now, I can't really mimic Brother Ward real good. He, yeah, well, what we used to do. He said, they bring in the ministers that were, that were of ordination. Set them in a chair in front of a whole, the, the presbytery. And they wouldn't even do anything. They just sit there. And look at you. So somebody said, well, what were they doing, Brother Ward? He said, we were discerning them. 
We were waiting for the Holy Ghost to tell us, was there anything in their life that shouldn't be there that would prohibit them from being in ministry? We discerned them, thinking. Now we look and say, where'd you go to Bible school? How many, how many years have you been on staff somewhere? Okay, we'll ordain you. He said, we discerned them. We waited for the Holy Ghost. Because you can have the years of Bible school, you can have the years of service, and you can be running around with the women in church and nobody know about it. Except them women. Hello. That's why it says lay hands on nobody suddenly. They need to be discerned. They need to be, you know, why? Because you don't want to cause them to be shipwrecked, and you don't want them to cause other people to be shipwrecked because they got shipwrecked. Amen? So I, I, I learned I learned from the Brother Summerall's and the Brother Ward's and the uh, T.L. Osborne's and the Ed Dufresne's and the um, uh, Buddy Harrison's and the, these different men we sat at, sat at meet with and heard and, and sat in the room with them and learned, praise the Lord, and got ministered to and got blessed. Amen? And Paul said, you know, the things you've heard, commit to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Um, wow. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Now we got this idea in the kingdom of God and the, in the word of faith circles, the charismatic word of faith grace circles. Now that we have to add another label to us because now that, that bunch is now the grace bunch. Um, we ain't ever going to have any trouble. Brother Hagin used to say that. He'd say, some folks think they're going through life on flowery beds of ease. And the blessings of God fall on them, on, on them like ripe cherries off a tree. And he knew that wasn't true. He tried to tell us. He tried to tell us people wouldn't listen. They go out and te- they say amen and go out and teach exactly the opposite of what he said. Go out and teach exactly the opposite. No, nope. you got to endure hardness. What's that mean? Satan, did you know that the Bible says put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day? Didn't it say if an evil day comes, it says in the evil day. Didn't say, put on the whole armor that you may be able to stand in the case an evil day shows up. As a matter of fact, you read Ephesians chapter 6, you find it's coming. Get ready and be prepared. Anyway, you endure hardness as a good soldier. No man that warth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who chooses him, who's chosen him to be a soldier. For men strive for masteries, yet he is not crowned, except he strive lawfully. You can't, there's no shortcuts to doing what God called you to do. Hello. Husband that laboreth must be partaker of the fruits. In other words, ministers need to be compensated. Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding of all things. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. We trust that you were blessed by the word of God and the flow of the spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or Using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.